Go ahead. Hold on. Go ahead, Donna. Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. It's January 11th, and I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.30 p.m., and I'm going to take our attendance by roll call, so if you could please just let me know that you're here when I call your name. Commissioner Beeman? Present. Commissioner Busby? Here. Commissioner Jacobs? I'm here. Commissioner Neville here. Uh, Commissioner Salomon? Here. And Commissioner Sandino? Commissioner Sandino? David, you're muted. Yes, David is muted. David, um, can you unmute yourself? Let's come back to him. Maybe he's having trouble with his mic or something. Um, and can, uh, Commissioner Sufi. Here. Oh, there you are. Hi, Kern. Hello. Um, David, are you, can you, are you able to unmute yourself? Well, okay. I know that he's here, so <laughs> we'll move ahead. So our um, first order of business is the approval of the agenda. Is there any public comment on the agenda itself? Seeing none. So, oh, hello. Is uh, there a David, movement? David available now? Oh. David, oh. I, I just wanted to record you for attendance. Hmm. Okay, we'll come back. We'll we, we saw him and then we didn't see him again. So is there a motion to approve the agenda? Also move. Moved by Jacobs. Is there a second? Second, Sufi. Okay, Sufi, thank you. For meeting ID followed by pound. Oh, I think someone is logging in under the non-panelist. Elena, that's what's happening. No, oh, I'll call the, I'll call the roll. Um, uh, Ezra Beeman? You entered nine, three, one, six, seven, Aye. eight, eight, three, two, three, four. This meeting ID. Doug Bowers. Here. Uh, yes, I. Sorry. Uh, Paul Jacobs? Here. Yes, I. <laughs> Neville, I. Ray Solomon? I. David Sandino? I muted him and then because he, that was his phone. And so now he is not responding yet. So maybe he's calling in. Okay. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Sufi? Aye. Very good. All right. So our next item of business is brief announcements from staff, chair, commissioners, and liaisons. Um, Council Member Carson, did you have any announcements you wanted to make? Just one that I'm making at each of my commissions. We're really encouraging folks to join uh, the testing program that's going on um, at healthydavistogether.org. Um, I was there at uh, one of the sites yesterday and uh, there weren't too many people there. There's plenty of, of uh, 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 reservations people can make to, to come in. You can get in and out in five minutes, and we believe this is really essential to not just the safety of our residents, but from adding in the financial aspect to the restoration of normal business activity in this community. That that means jobs for, uh, and and business activity and revenue to our city. So uh, very easy to register and sign up. Anyone who lives in Davis or works in Davis can partake in this program. Thank you for that reminder. Yes, it's super important and it is, you're right. It's very quick and easy. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, Elena, did you have any um, updates or comments you wanted to make? Well, I nothing huge, but I did wanted to say that um, 
Pam Day, uh, who's been um, assisting with this commission and I've been a financial services manager for the city for a very long time. Um, she is planning on retiring at the end of January. So I don't see her on this uh, call right now, but I just wanted to express my appreciation for everything she's been doing for the city um, and wishing her well in uh, her retirement plans. So just wanted to give everybody a heads up that um, you know Pam will not be with us uh, very soon. She's still with the city obviously, but um, I just wanted to say thank you for all the work she's done with the city. So thank just you. a heads up to everybody. We really appreciate her too as well. Thank you for that. Um, I don't have any announcements. Um, other commissioners, in any special announcements any of you would like to make? And I do not see any raised hands or comments, so we will move on. So our next item of business is just general public comment. This is for public comment for items that are not on our agenda. And um, I only received one, but it was not directed to us as commissioners. It was just a, a copy from some comments that were provided to the council. So I don't know that I need to read that. I don't have any other general public comments. Are there any others, Elena, or is anyone on the line who wants to make general public comment? Um, well, if anyone is on the call, please uh, press star nine um, or raise hand if you're actually watching online via Zoom. And we have none. Okay, great. So no public comment. Very good. Our next item of business is our consent calendar, which contains just one item, which is our minutes from our last meeting. Uh, any public comment on our consent calendar? Um, We're not seeing any. Don't see any. Again, if uh, anyone would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand if you're watching via Zoom or um, star nine if you're on the phone. None. Great, thank you. We do have a raised hand by Paul Jacobs, so I'm not sure if it's on this item or not. It's it's, it's on the it's on the minutes. Okay. Um, I'm a little confused about the subcommittee restructure item. It we added a sub. Did we add a subcommittee for local content? I know that was proposed, but I don't remember voting on that. And maybe the chair can just do that, uh, or or we can talk about it later. Uh, in the agenda, um, the whole night. I think there was a, there was also the a shall raise cost. that issue. I think, and it's a good one. So, so Paul, for me to know, I'd have to go back and and listen to the tape for sure. So, what we could do is we can approve our minutes with the understanding that I'll go back, or Karen will go back, and we'll listen really carefully to the motion. Um, we can always create that ad hoc subcommittee tonight if we aren't sure if we did it, it's easy to fix. So we have a couple options. Donna, would you have a raised hand by Ray Solomon? Okay, Ray. Yeah, I'm not listed in item one, commissioners present, but I'm listed in item two as the person making the motion. So I think I need to be added to item one. Yeah, I will will add you in. And sometimes that happens if someone hops on the phone a little bit late, but um, I don't recall that. So we'll just add you in there. Any other corrections to the minutes? I move approval is amended. Oh, wait, sorry. Before oh, you sorry. do, okay. I couldn't get my hand up. Um, a general question I had around minute taking. I noticed, and I don't know how this has been done in the past, but I noticed that it, what's noted is if comment was comments were made, but not what the actual comments contained. Mm -hmm. I, I guess this is an overarching question about what, what should notes note? Well, the preferred practice for minutes these days is that they, first and foremost, they tell you what action was taken by a commission and what was, you know, but they, and they generally don't list and spell out every public comment that was made. They might generally summarize them and say, you know, there were four speakers who all urged the commission to do X or something like that. But the, the preferred practice is to summarize public comment. 
and to not try to restate what everyone said. Okay, uh, the specific item I had in mind was, you know, Paul gave a number of, uh, of feedback items on the, the paper that I had last time. Um, and it'd be good to just have, I guess, a record of stuff like that, but I understand it can get overwhelming. Thanks. Yeah. I, I have long, long felt that it would be nice to have at least a bit more in the minutes. And I would agree with Ray, uh, with uh, Ezra, that uh, I don't know, it's, it's a burden on staff, I realize, and or on someone if we decide to do our own minutes. But some commissions have much more detailed uh, minutes. I don't think we need excruciating detail but it might be useful to the council and to the public if we had uh, at least a sense of the discussion on some issues at least. But I'm not sure where we, sh we should go with that, but maybe is there a way, we, maybe we could have a, a, an ad hoc committee consider some options. Well, what I'm hearing though is especially to the extent that the commission is sort of giving some specific guidance to a subcommittee on what they want to see in a proposal. You'd want to see that at a minimum reflected in the minutes as a way of recording what was discussed. But I'm not, I'm not hearing people suggesting we want to have this sort of restatement of every question, every comment, because that tends to just get very overwhelming and unuseful. The art of note taking is an art. Yep. Mm -hmm. It is. It really is. So, so for now, let's, let's, these are all points well taken, but let's kind of move forward to at least well, approving our minutes um, for this, you know, this item um, with the understanding that I will go back and, and, you know, look at whether we actually approve the content subcommittee. Are there other corrections? So seeing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved, Solomon. And a second. Since my mic is on, I'll second. Seconded by Jacobs. Okay, so I'll call the roll. Uh, Ezra Beeman. Aye. Fred Busby. Aye. Paul Jacobs. Aye. Donna Neville. Aye. Ray Solomon. Aye. David Sandino. And Gokern Sufi. I, I can see David, but I think he's having um, some kind of audio trouble or something because it, it looks like he's here and on the phone, but muted. It's hard to tell. So he's now speaking. <laughs> he is now speaking. Oh, how can you tell that he's speaking? I can see his lips moving. Oh, um, it's frustrating. So is Elena, are you able to unmute him for where, from where you are? It only allows me to ask him to unmute, but it doesn't actually unmute him. I think maybe the microphone may not be connected. So if there's an arrow generally above the mute button, if you hit that arrow, you get a, a little list of connectable Oh. settings, microphone and speaker. And so you would want to select your microphone. So sometimes you might have two or three different options. If, if you click through them, eventually one of them will. <laughs> yeah, I've had, this, I've had this problem, I know. And so I sometimes turn off my microphone uh, so we know and we then know I David's forget to turn here. it back on again. So. so we know David's here. And as soon as we get the, the audio fixed, we can let him record his votes. So, so our next item, which is very exciting, we have a special guest this evening, and I um, think that she's actually going to do her own intro and bio, which is certainly fine, but I'm just very excited that we have Irina Asmussen, who is the Chief Economist from the California Department of Finance here tonight to talk to us about the state of California's economy. So Irina, I just want to hand it over to you and let you go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the chief economist at the California Department of Finance, but probably more relevant for you um, is that I am daughter number two of the former mayors, Vic Fuss Asmussen and Ruth Asmussen. Um, I am also the sister of trustee Vigdis Asmussen of the school board. 
Um, and I grew up about two blocks away from City Hall. Uh, so I know Davis. Um, I grew up uh, with Davis issues. And whenever I am doing the population and economic and revenue forecasts for California, Davis is one of the places that I think about. Um, and so I wanted to give back a little bit and go over our forecast that we just released on Friday. Um, so this is the forecast that was the basis for the governor's budget that was released on Friday. Um, this is all posted publicly on the Department of Finance website. Um, I'm happy to point staff to that area. Um, and we really encourage people to use that forecast um, as the basis for their own forecasts. So I'm gonna try and share my screen. Um, Um, so I am only going to go over part of the governor's budget that was released on Friday. I'm just going over the demographic, economic, and revenue forecast part. I'm not going over the spending. Um, that would be a separate section. Um, those are all contained uh, within the budget. Um, those would have the local implications, both of the realignment um, and spending for education and other issues. So um, to be a forecaster is to know that you are going to be wrong about things. Um, and as the governor reflected on this time last year, um, we thought everything was great. We had 10 plus years of expansion, which was record breaking territory for the United States. Um, you know, there was a peak of 12.3 unemployment in California during the great recession that had gone down to a record low. Um, I had to revise my forecast several times because I never thought that California was going to go below 5.5% actually, um, and it went down below 4%. It was really unprecedented. Um, we had a very long stretch of job growth. Um, California was outpacing the rest of the United States. We were doing really well. Um, so everything looked really great. And yet things fell apart. Um, I will share it that I was actually on vacation when all of this happened. Um, I had been taking a break. I was on the other side of the world. I was literally in Tasmania um, and then all of this started happening. Um, I will mention that uh, my mother who is generally right about just about everything had gotten very worried about COVID in January. And we had kind of made fun of her because we thought that she was just worrying over nothing. Um, but as usual, she was perfectly right about that. And she was perfectly right to start isolating last January. Um, we went up to 16.4% unemployment in California. Um, again, that's record-breaking territory that clearly outpaces the worst during the Great Recession, which we thought was going to be a once-in-a-lifetime sort of cataclysm. Um, and that happened in two months. Um, <clears throat> the pace of it and the scale of it was truly, truly frightening. 16.4% is, in fact, an understatement of how much our entire economy was disrupted because the unemployment rate is defined as the number of people who um, are actively looking or employed who are out of work. And a whole bunch of people lost their jobs and were not able to look for work because they were either looking after children or they were, you know, uh, had health issues and so did not feel comfortable looking for work. So the true measure that we prefer about how many people lost their jobs was about 25% of the February labor force all of a sudden were unemployed. It was astounding. You saw that in the streets of Davis. You saw that all over the place. Um, GDP growth also was in record-breaking territory. Um, usually GDP growth for California and the United States is measured in terms of single digits. Our GDP dropped by a third. Um, one in six California jobs were lost within those two months. Three months, I'm sorry, <coughs> March, April, and May. It was just astounding. We went from a 5.6 billion surplus to a projected deficit of $54.3 billion. That's a lot of money. <coughs> so, um, there were a number of very difficult decisions uh, that we had to take. Um, I am very proud of the fact that for the previous seven years, 
the team at finance had been talking about recessions happen. <clears throat> They're inevitable. We should plan for them. We know that we have very volatile revenues. We should build up our reserves. Thank goodness we did that. And we didn't have to, you know, send out, <coughs> excuse me. We didn't have to send out warrants. Um, we had the time and the space to consider what was going on. And <coughs> sorry, I've been talking all day. And so that's one of the things that I'm sure that you are considering, how much of a reserve to build up, um, how to smooth over that cycle. Okay. So again, this is the last set of population projections that we did. And this was pre-COVID. Um, so let me walk you through this chart. This is the population growth for California as a whole. And the red line is um, the net. And then it, uh, the net is composed of births, deaths, and net migration. So the births are in blue. Those are positive. Um, in typical times, California does benefit from net in migration. And in our forecast um, at the beginning of 2020, you can see that we thought that we were going to go back to net positive migration. That is composed of four different types of flows. So into and out of um, California from other states and into and out of California from other countries. So um, <clears throat> generally speaking, before this year, what we had was people on net leaving California for other states, and that was outweighed by um, people on net moving to California from other countries. That's why there's a positive yellow line in the forecast. You can also see <clears throat> that that blue line is very flat. The number of kids being born, very flat. If you have an increasing uh, population, in fact, that is a declining fertility rate. You can also see that deaths are increasing over time. <coughs> um, that doesn't include COVID. And um, in fact, COVID probably would only lead to a small blip in this, but it is increasing because the population is aging. So um, this is really, you know, the baby boomers reaching the end of their natural lifespans. Okay. So this is the more recent annual population change from for 1990 through 2020. These are actuals in our estimates. Um, so again, the red line is the net, the blue line is the births, the yellow is the migration. And because of COVID, we got almost no international immigration. So there was no international immigration to balance out people leaving California for other states. And in fact, there was a slightly larger number of people on net who left California for other states. You also see that there were deaths <clears throat> um, it was not a huge bump, um, but we got to almost net zero population growth. So in the future, um, we are going to be updating our population projections. Um, we are expecting to get the new census numbers from 2020 at the end of this calendar year and also into next year. And then we're going to be rebasing all of our population projections. We're also going to be restating what we realized had happened from 2010 through 2020. Um, so that's a really important thing for staff to look at and for you to look at as well, because some of those per capita numbers will probably change once we figure out what has been happening over the last 10 years. Okay. Are there any questions, by the way? Are we allowed to take questions? Okay. You should interrupt me if you do have questions. Um, I might not actually see your hand being raised because I can't see everyone's face, um, but just I think you can unmute yourselves and interrupt me. Well, since you since you since you invited the question, um, do you have any sense as to what the net where that red line is going to go in the next 10, 15, 20 years? I, I, I think on the previous slide you showed that there's that it would it would bounce back up. Is, is that right? Um, so this was our old projection. Um, we are going to be considering what has been happening and what we think is going to happen in the future. Um, so we're going to be figuring that out. Um, I will tell you that in other states where population growth has gone negative, 
And there are a couple of states where population growth has been negative. Um, Illinois is one, New York is another, um, Maine I think also recently went negative. Um, typically, it is a transition that continues. So <clears throat> again, California is a little bit unusual in that we do tend to attract so many international immigrants. And so if we, again, get international immigration to the state, um, uh, or if there's a lot of uh, job growth here, then we do tend to get people back. So we're going to be considering those um, and trying to figure out what, what we think is going to happen. Um, but the declining birth rate is something that we think is going to be here for a while, um, which is very relevant for the school district as well. And I think um, there are a couple of people from the school district who are attending tonight. Okay. So <clears throat> here are some visualizations that I really like. <laughs> these are called population pyramids. And these give you a sense of what is happening with a population of an area. So the way to read these is, this is the number of people who are in California at each age range. So these are divided by five-year age ranges, <clears throat> all the way from zero up to 100. Um, if you look at the population pyramid on your, uh, on your left, um, <clears throat> you can see the contrast between 1980 and 2000. The outlined bars are the population in 1980. So clearly all of those bars are within the 2000. So that means that the overall population in 2000 in California was larger than the population in 1980. You can also see where there tend to be different people, more people at the different age ranges. So in 1980, um, there was that big bulge in the 15 through about 35 year old range. Those are the baby boomers. There's clearly a bulge. They were moving to California. That was the beginning of our decade of really fast population growth. By 2000, um, they were a little bit older and they had started having kids. Um, so you can see both the baby boomers and the echo boom, the millennials. Um, you can also see that these are called population pyramids because when they were invented, they really were like a triangle. They were like a pyramid um, because people died off. Now um, they look a little bit more like a cylinder with a pyramid at the top. Um, and so they're just a little bit different, but there is that pyramid at the top. Um, on the right, you can see the contrasting population pyramids for 1980 and 2020, so this year. Um, again, in 2020, the population is clearly larger than it was in 1980. And you can see that there's far more mass at the top. That's people living longer. That's great. People have a longer life expectancy. People stay healthier for longer. But it also means that if we are thinking about our population and who is paying taxes, and we are exempting people who are above 65, you're leaving out a lot of the population. Um, so you can also see that there's a bulge still at the 20 year old, 25 year old. California does tend to attract both um, lots of college students, um, a lot of new graduates, <clears throat> which we benefit from, and also military. So military is less important now, but um, that does lead to a little bulge in that age range. You can also see <clears throat> the shrinking birth rate. So the pyramid is narrower. It's not even a cylinder anymore um, at that zero to five-year-old age range. That's because people are having fewer kids. Okay. Um, this is Yolo County. Um, by the way, all of these population pyramids and these visualizations are on our website in case you want to play around with it or look at other counties. Um, when I give talks, uh, I do tend to put up Yolo County just because it's so striking to see UC Davis. So you can see um, Yolo County again in 1980 through 2000. Um, there's more people in 2000 than there were in 1980. There's still that bulge. Um, you can, on the right, you see 2000 versus 1980, much bigger bulge. Um, that is the expansion of UC Davis. Um, UC Davis is one of the only UCs that still has the land to expand. Um, we did build UC Merced recently, but if we want to put pe more people through the UC system, then the University of California at Davis is probably going to be one of those places. Um, you can also see that there is a larger 
number of people in those older age ranges. So it does change. Um, you also see that there's it's kind of skinnier, both in the prime working age, so the 35, 40, 45 year olds, um, and there's fewer kids. Um, so again- Irina? Yes. Hi, I can turn on my uh, video. Um, this is a very striking graphic, uh, and this is just your, this is your old county, right? Mm -hmm. So the Davis, the ratio of UCD to Davis is also going to be significantly greater, <clears throat> at least on the, the the one on the right than on the left, right? Because if you peel away, you peel away all the rest of the the bodies from Woodland and West Sac, et cetera, they're going to draw from the main shape, but um, the Davis will the, the remaining Davis people will then be a smaller but similar shape. Uh, and those mm -hmm. big spikes are gonna be proportionally much larger. So what I'm trying to say is this is suggesting that we are like if we are uh, vastly outnumbered compared to where we were, I guess, 20 years ago, so 80 versus 2000. Yeah. Yep. One question I wanted to ask earlier, cause you had that forecast into the future. Are you gonna later on talk about your latest forecast into the future or should I ask my question now? Uh, so we are in the process of updating those projections. Um, so, you know, like I talked about the projections that we released at the beginning of 2020, but we already know that those are probably unrealistic for a number of reasons. Well, the ones that you had before are showing basically a, a, a decline to net no new growth, right? And I can't remember mm -hmm. how, what the axis went out to, but if this state is 2060, if mm -hmm. the state is heading to that sort of a situation, all of our processes and thinking that are that are really anchored to growth assumptions are going to come come under pressure. Let alone the demographics, uh, change in demographics. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty interesting. Luckily, in twenty fifty, hopefully, I'll be in a different position. Um, so I will point out that other countries um, have gone through this demographic transition. Um, Germany has already gone through it. Uh, Japan has gone through it. Japan does have a shrinking population. Um, and, you know, even though the aggregate is shrinking, someplace like, like Davis could actually grow. So, you know, if, if you are thinking in terms of a standard proportion of people um, go to college, and so if the population ages and there's fewer people in that age range, then the number of people going to college is going to go down. Well, that could be outweighed by a higher proportion of students going to college. So, um, you know, just because something is happening at the aggregate doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to hold true at um, at the level of someplace like Davis. So, you do have to think about sort of the assumptions that are going into your forecast. Thank and you, you know, if it, it could mean that you are going in a different direction than the rest of the aggregate. Sounds like Davis. Could be. Davis is special. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm giving a talk soon. So I put in Alameda County if you want to look at sort of what happens in Alameda County um, or Contra Costa County. Um, again, both high growth places. Um, lots of people have, have moved there. <clears throat> okay. So one of the sort of correlates of this aging population is uh, a chart like this. Okay, so let me walk you through this. This goes back all the way to 2000. The vertical lines um, that are shaded, those are recessions. Um, and then this is the labor force and working age population divided up by age ranges. So the 16 through 24 year olds, um, I'm gonna date myself and say, back when I was in high school, basically everyone worked, like people had jobs. Um, that's much less common now. So, um, the greens are the 16 through 24 year olds. Uh, the medium shaded one in each of these bands by different colors are the ones who are employed. The ones who are the darkest band in the middle of each of those colors, those are the people who are actively looking for work. So those are the people who are counted as unemployed. And then the lightest shade at the top, so the light green on top of those, are the ones who are not in the labor force. They are not actively looking for work and they're not in work. So the proportion of 16 through 24 year olds who are actually in the labor force has gone down over time. <clears throat> Notice by the way, from 2000 through 2020, that bar is basically flat. So the number of 16 through 24 year olds, even though our population has been expanding, 
has not grown at all. That's a consequence of fewer people being born. Um, so fewer people in the younger age ranges are employed or in the labor force. That can be very benign because they're staying in school for longer. So people don't graduate from high school and go straight into work. They tend to go to community college or they go to UC Davis or they go to a different UC or they go to a CSU and they get some extra education. That should make people more productive and you know that's generally a good thing. <clears throat> the middle band is the, the blue bands. Those are the prime working age. So that's the 25 through 54 year olds. Those are the ones um, you can see that lots of them remained unemployed for a very long time after the Great Recession. So that middle shaded bit. Um, but generally speaking, almost everyone in that age range is working. There's very few people who can afford to be out of the labor force. Once you get to the 55 and plus year olds, those are the orange bands, you can see that's where all of our population growth has been. That's where all of our labor force growth has been. The rest of them basically been flat since 2000. Um, so if we are going to have an increasing labor force, it's going to have to come from the 55 plus year olds. Um, but even though their participation, so that medium shaded and the darkest shaded in the orange bands, those have been going up, so a higher proportion are still working. They tend to retire pretty quickly. So they don't stay unemployed for very long. They either find another job or they retire. It's one of the terrifying things. Right now, we do have, here, I'll show you the population for California again. We do have a higher proportion of people now who are 55 plus. So they are in that age range when they might just drop out of the labor force if they lose their job. That means that if they don't have a lot in retirement savings and they have to start drawing on their pension or if they have to start drawing on social security prematurely, they're permanently going to be um, at a lower level of income. Now, if you own a home, things are a little bit different. Um, if you've paid off your mortgage, then you can be stabilized. On the other hand, um, because housing has been such a problem in California and it remains a problem in Davis, um, fewer people now are homeowners than before. And homeownership does tend to be very concentrated amongst the older generation, the 65 plus year olds, those working age people, they're less likely to own a home. So there are some vulnerabilities underlying some of the growth that we've seen in the past couple of decades. So, sorry, this is another slightly complicated chart. The thing that I want you to take away from this is that a lot of the growth that happened since 2010, it's been really concentrated. Um, lower income people have not done very well. Higher income people have done just great. Um, so they went into the pandemic doing just fine. Like they had increased their uh, household income. Lower income people had just started doing pretty okay, starting in about 2016. They had recovered to 2010 levels, um, but they really only got a couple of years of growth, whereas the higher income people, they'd been growing for a decade. Um, this is a chart that we had not in this governor's budget, but in last governor's budget that we used to illustrate where some of the squeezes have been. So this is the actual number of adult households. So people who can you know, share resources and live together, that's the blue line. Um, and then we wanted to you know, get a sense of what would have happened if we would have built enough to keep up with demand. So if we still had the same crowdedness metrics um, per adult uh, that we had at different points. So the dashed red line is uh, the crowdedness levels of 2010. So if you say, okay, we're gonna have the same number of adults per household that we had in 2010, what would have happened? So notice that from about 2000 through about 2010, the, the dashed red line and the blue line lie on top of each other. So that means that that massive housing boom that we thought was happening, all of those houses being built, it was just keeping up with the adult population. It wasn't actually a boom. That was just keeping up with demand. 
And then because we've built so few houses since then, as of about 2018, we had a gap of about half a million housing units. Just to Even clarify, gone, this, I'm sorry. sorry just, this is, oh, go ahead, sorry. Okay. Let, me, let me finish with the green line and, and then you can ask your question. So if you go back to the crowdedness levels for adults of 1980, <clears throat> which was a couple of years after I was born, um, and you have housing growth keep up with that crowdedness level, you would be on the green line. In that case, you would be behind by about 2 million housing units. So um, you can clearly see this is a long standing problem in California. It's why housing is so expensive in California. <coughs> and it really drives a lot of what goes on. I'm sorry, Doug. Um, so this is both for sale housing and rental housing. This is all so this is rental housing. This is second homes. This is like every single housing unit in the state of California, whether or not it's used as permanent housing or not. Sure. Thanks. So in a sense, um, our problem is probably a little bit worse just because a number of people are wealthier and tend to have a second home. That was much less common 30, 40 years ago. So the actual level of the housing stock that is available for sale or for rent um, to use as a primary residence is actually lower than this. But we wanted to sort of, you know, do as naive a calculation as we possibly could. Um, the other calculation, and I don't have the chart on this um, because it's too depressing. The um, So as you know, I grew up in Davis. <clears throat> I hear my uncles and my parents talk about back in the day when housing cost like a couple thousand dollars. Um, clearly housing costs have gone up. You have to adjust that for inflation. But the way that I like to think about this is to look at what is the house price as a multiple of what someone's income is. So if you look at California as a whole, um, and keep in mind that affordable uh, is about a multiple of three. If you want to stretch it, you can do a multiple of four. But affordable, if you want to spend no more than 30% of your household budget on your housing costs, then it would be about a multiple of three for your annual um, for your annual salary to the purchase price of the house. So if you were making full-time minimum wage of $30,000 at $50 an hour next year, um, then you should be able to buy a $90,000 house, which is clearly impossible anywhere in California. So that multiple um, in 1980 was about three. It was a little bit above, about three and a half. Um, that multiple now, so house prices in Davis, um, probably at least $750,000. The median income in California is right around $72,000, $73,000. So that multiple is now 10. Um, clearly something has changed. Um, clearly housing is much more unaffordable than it used to be. Okay. Okay, here's the other way um, that I like to talk about pre-existing inequality. So um, you can look at uh, what kind of wage someone earns in different sectors. So the horizontal blue line, that's the 2019 average wage. So this is from 2007 to 2019. Um, and the way to read this is if the bubble is below that blue line, then it means that it's a below average sector. If it's above, it's a above average wage sector. And then if it's to the right of that vertical line, then it means it's net added jobs. If it's to the left, then it's net lost jobs. <clears throat> so for example, you can see that manufacturing tends to be above average, but it's lost jobs since 2007. Starting from 2007 to 2019, it net lost jobs. Um, retail trade as well, lost jobs. A lot of the growth happened in health and educational services. That's in-home supportive services a lot. Um, by the way, teachers and appears in local government. So state and local government is just about average wage. Um, it's gained a couple of, of jobs, 
but not as much as health and educational services. And sorry, the last piece of this chart, <clears throat> the size of the bubble tells you how many people were employed in that sector. So for example, health and educational services added a ton of jobs between 2007 and 2019, below average wages, um, and it employs a lot of people. Leisure and hospitality, below average wages, employs quite a lot of people, added a lot of jobs. Professional scientific and technical services and information, those are the two big ones in the upper right quadrant. Um, that's where a lot of the tech sector is. So you can see that there was pre-existing inequality in California before we even went into the pandemic. Okay, <clears throat> you can see how all of this moved. Um, this is our forecast for 2024 Q4 relative to 2020 Q1. So you can see leisure and hospitality. We think it's just not going to recover in California. State and local government, we think is going to be smaller. Retail trade, not going to recover by 2024. Some of the higher wage sectors, they're gonna do just fine. And that mirrors a lot of what we've seen during this pandemic. <clears throat> a lot of low income people who don't have a lot in resources, who don't have a lot in reserves, who probably are disproportionately renters, they lost their jobs. <clears throat> people who've been able to transition to working from home, they're doing just fine. So this really, really has been an intensification of inequality in California. <coughs> Sorry, this is a different way of looking at it. This is high wage sectors versus low wage sectors. You can see how big that drop was and how much we've recovered. So higher wage sectors, they're about 5% down in, as of November. Um, lower wage sectors, they're still down by a million jobs, almost, um, and more than 10%. <clears throat> the stock market is doing just fine. This is the other thing that has been so surprising, and it's one of the big reasons why I was so wrong about my revenue forecast, which people are doing just fine. Um, there are signs of recovery. Um, you can see sort of the recovery um, in California. We think we're probably back to around 2019 levels beginning. Um, <clears throat> this is how long we think it's going to take us to recover non-farm payroll jobs. Um, by the way, these are all charts that are coming from the governor's budget, so you can also see more discussion if you are interested. Um, <clears throat> sorry. The thing that I wanted to say for this was that um, it's the solid blue line, which is our baseline forecast. <clears throat> and we think that it's going to take us almost six years, probably about 2025, to get back to 2019 levels of jobs. So, you know, people are going to be hurting for a very long time in California. <clears throat> Davis could move faster, it could move slower. Um, we can talk about that if you want, um, but you know, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be affected. Okay. Hi, this is uh, Ezra again. Um, can you maybe try and give us some insight into how you've driven this? Is this like an input output model? Um, I'd like to understand sort of what's gone into this. And just to give you some background, I was recently involved in a national transport emissions study mm -hmm. and COVID impacts obviously are impacting all the sectors, right? So this is the labor market. Um, and some of the key questions we had were, you know, is what was the structure? What were the structural implications of COVID on transport? You know, so I guess I would like to understand with respect to the job market, how did you, uh, what was the sort of core methodology if you could spend a little bit of time? So California's forecast is based on um, a US forecast that we buy from IHS market. Um, they are a national provider of US forecasts. Um, and then My alma mater. we look at um, that forecast and we decide whether or not we think that it is reflective of the assumptions that we want to make. So for example, um, earlier in the year, they were pricing in that there was going to be a second round of federal stimulus, which didn't actually occur until December. Um, so they were being much more optimistic and we unwound that in the California forecast. Um, so then the California forecast 
looks at that forecast and has a model um, of regressions that we use to run out um, how California is correlated with those along with other uh, correlates. <clears throat> and then we adjust that to, um, to adjust for known policy changes that are going to happen in the future. So for example, when California started requiring that uh, transportation fuels buy cap and trade emissions credits, uh, we had to price that into our forecast because we knew that gas prices were not going to be what the national prices were. Or for example, if we know that um, there's something that's going to be happening in one of the sectors, um, you know, for example, minimum wage, when minimum wage goes up, we also look very closely at what, that, what that's going to do to the minimum wage sectors. So um, that's generally Thanks. how we do our forecast. Thank you. Um, Okay, so transportation has been very interesting. Um, I will tell you that there are a couple of things that I think were kind of silver linings of the whole pandemic. One was people stayed home right away. Okay, people are having more trouble staying home right now, um, but it was remarkable to me how much people changed their behavior so suddenly. And you know, in climate change, we know that we have to change our behavior a lot. And people would tell me, oh, there's no way that people could give up their cars. There's no way that people could change their behavior. Well, the pandemic was a huge, massive experiment in how we can all work from home. I think some of that is going to be very sticky. I think that um, a lot more people are going to be able to work from home. That's a little bit worrisome for California, because one of the reasons why we've done so well is that people have felt like they have to be close to their jobs. So they've been willing to pay very high prices for housing and they've been willing to pay very high prices to yeah. remain in California to be close. And that might no longer be true. Um, we do not have continued out migration from California built into our forecast, um, but we do have very slow labor force growth. Um, and we don't have an exodus from California built in, but it is one of the risks that we talk about in our forecast. So, um, notice as well that we have both an optimistic scenario where the economy just recovers much faster than we think we'll recover in three years, or we have a much slower recovery, um, which would take longer than eight years. So we do try to do scenario analysis. Um, it's one of the things that I really recommend. Um, you know, like I said, to be a forecaster is to know that you're going to be wrong about something um, and having to do scenarios that say, okay, what if things play out in a different way? You don't have to do every single different contingency plan, but just doing a couple to be able to bound how much things could change under different scenarios can be really useful for helping people make decisions. Um, and ironically, you know, I, I think the team had sort of resisted doing alternative scenarios for a long time because they thought that it would undercut the credibility of their baseline forecast. I have generally found that when we do alternative scenarios and we walk people where we could go wrong, um, it makes people trust our forecast more. Um, and it helps because it helps them understand how their decisions might have to change based on how the, the scenario might play out. So, you know, if you have the capacity to do so, highly recommend doing at least one alternative scenario. Generally speaking, people care much more about the negative scenario than they do care about the positive scenario. But in this case, there was symmetric risk on both sides. Okay. Um, let's go into revenues for a minute. Um, I think I might be abusing your time, but. Um, so this is California state revenues. Um, we put this in a couple of years in a row because I like this chart so much. Um, this goes back all the way to 1950. And it shows you how much the structure, uh, and this is general fund revenues, this is not all revenues. Um, it shows you how much the structure of revenues in California has changed. So the red part in the middle, those are personal income taxes. The blue bars at the bottom, those are retail sales and use tax. Um, the green parts are the corporation taxes. Um, we used to have an estate tax. We no longer have an estate tax and that would be difficult to change without a constitutional amendment. Um, and then the other taxes 
um, which I should have looked up again, but they're a whole mishmash of other things. So um, you can see sales tax has gone down, personal income taxes has gone up, um, corporate taxes, they've managed to just remain pretty steady. So um, this is California's progressive tax system writ large. Now you can see this huge shift starting in the 80s. And that is when uh, Prop 13 started to bite. And because property taxes started going down, um, locals are not allowed to impose personal income taxes, but the state can. So the state started leaning more on personal income taxes um, and redistributing to locals. So you can see by the end, um, about two thirds of the general fund depends on personal income taxes. Half of those personal income taxes come from the top 1% of taxpayers. So the top 1% of taxpayers is responsible for about a third of the general fund. Um, that is both good and bad. That is 100% a policy choice. Um, given how well the top 1% has done over the past couple of decades, I think that it is great that California has a progressive tax system, um, but it also means that we also have a very volatile tax system. So that's why reserves are so important. Okay. Maybe this is a dumb question, but what happened to property tax? Doesn't any of that go to the state? Um, it does, but it doesn't go to the general fund because of Prop 98. Um, so it used to partially go, so yes, it, it goes through the general fund, but because there's been so many policy changes and because it's automatically allocated, we generally leave it out of these things. Um, but property taxes are doing just fine. I mean, we have record high home prices. We are still building more houses, like housing permits are down a little bit, but they are basically at around 100,000 um, permits for the entire year, um, which is down maybe a couple of percent uh, versus 2019. So property taxes are doing just fine. Um, I think we said that they're up by about 5%, which is a little bit lower than normal, but is still growing. Um, so these are the long-term revenue forecasts. Um, so I did not put up the chart that compared our May revision and budget forecast with this because it looked much more dire at the Budget Act and then we were gloriously wrong. Um, so we do get growth. It is slower growth than usual, I will admit that. Um, so it's not like everything is as good as we thought it was going to be um, at the beginning of 2020. Um, but because we have that progressive tax system, we're doing just fine. Um, the other interesting thing that really happened was sales and use tax didn't drop like we thought. So a lot of um, wealthier people shifted their spending from non-taxable services to taxable goods. Um, I am sure that you have, maybe not you, but I'm sure the city council has heard from Recology about the big increase in packaging. Um, you know, people are shopping online. Uh, people are, are buying taxable goods, uh, which has really held up that sales and use tax. Um, depending on where those sales taxes are allocated to though, um, Davis may or may not make up for uh, the loss in retail sales downtown. So that's also something to keep an eye on. Um, we did do a recession scenario. We did warn we could lose a lot of money um, if the stock market falls or something else happens. Um, I think this is my final chart. Uh, this is taxable sales as a percent of personal income. So you saw on the previous chart how much uh, sales tax means for the entire general fund. This is how important taxable sales are in terms of someone's total personal income and spending. How did it used to be so high? Um, well, so people weren't spending more than 50% of their income on rent. So they had more um, scope for spending on taxable goods. Um, there, the structure of spending was also much different. So for example, um, you know, if I am getting my books through a Kindle Unlimited subscription, then I am not, you know, that's a subscription, that's a service. 
that is not actually a taxable good. Whereas if I go down to Avid Reader and I'm buying a book, that is taxable. Um, so all of these streaming services, all of these subscriptions, not taxable. It's not even, you know, for a while we were worried, okay, we need to um, go from movies to we need to like start taxing the DVDs or we need to tax digital downloads. But now there aren't even digital downloads because people don't own anything. They just subscribe to something. So it's just very different. Um, and our tax system has not been adjusted to take account of that. Okay, that was my last slide. Thank you so much. I, I know how what a busy time this is for you. And so we really appreciate it. If you don't mind, I would like to open it up and see if there are any members of the public who have comments. And then if commissioners have some further questions, do you have a few more minutes to stay on with us? We really appreciate it. So um, Elena, if we could see if there's any public comment on this presentation. So if you have any public commenters and you'd like to make a comment um, and you are on Zoom, please raise your hand. Otherwise, star nine um, if you're on the phone. And I see none. Okay, great. So if there are further comments or questions from commissioners. Can I make one other comment, actually, um, sure. that I hope that you're considering? So um, when it comes to our forecast and when it comes time to, you know, like, part of my job is to do these forecasts and part of my job is to advise the governor about things that he's considering. Um, and, you know, it is beyond my pay grade to make those decisions. Um, but what I really have to worry about is that the decisions that he is making or the assumptions that he is making are consistent. So for example, um, it would be inconsistent to say, uh, we are going to have a growing population and therefore you know you can assume that this policy is going to pay for itself because we're going to be able to spread the bond payments amongst lots more people so you know like the burden is going to be lower while at the same time knowing population growth is really bottomed out that would be an inconsistent um, assumption and that would be a problem because at some point that would stop that that inconsistency would become apparent um, the way that I think about this for Cal for Davis in particular is that, um, you know, we just, for a very long time, we have uh, built a lot of housing. And a lot of the housing that's been uh, sort of authorized more recently has been very geared towards students. So that's fine. It's fine to have zero growth if that's what the voters want. It's fine to have um, mostly uh, student housing being built. but if at the same time the university is saying, well, actually we're gonna have declining enrollment and we're building more dorms, then that's an inconsistent policy because all of those student oriented housing are going to go vacant if it's more um, cost effective for students to live on campus. So just, you know, part of, part of our forecasting is we look at data and we have regressions and we have models and we put those together. But really part of it is that storytelling aspect and walking through that narrative of what we think is going on and how it all fits together. Um, and that's the part where community involvement is really, really important because that's where you can sort of pick up on, oh, we didn't think about how that was working for that group of people. And so you can catch yourself from making inconsistent assumptions by really involving the public and making sure that the public understands what kinds of assumptions you are making. Thank you. Yeah, great, great point. Yes. Um, commissioners, are there other comments or questions? We have two, Donna. We have Paul Jacobs and Ray Solomon with raised hands. Fantastic. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, I was remembering that when Governor Davis got began to get in trouble over the budget. And we went from a very high surplus to a very, to a, a deficit. It, as I remember, it was because so many people real, uh, so many Californians realized lots of capital gains. And that what looked like a lot of money was actually a one time mm -hmm. uh, unsustainable growth. And some of what the legislature and the governor spent money on, they were all worthwhile things, I believe. 
but you couldn't sustain that growth. Uh, are we going to, can you tell from where surprisingly the revenues are, are, are pretty good of, at least can, they continue to grow in California, which surprised me. Uh, is that going to be, as you look ahead, is some of that gr recent growth uh, unsustainable because <clears throat> it has to do with things like stock market sales, for example, mm -hmm. and realizing capital gains? Yeah, so you are exactly right about that. Um, we do, um, okay, so if I knew how to predict the stock market, I would probably be making so much more money than I do right now. Um, but we do have assumptions about the stock market in our forecast. Um, we generally treat those capital gains as one-time money. And in fact, there's lots of sort of protections about what we can and cannot do uh, with those capital gains. Um, a lot of it is supposed to go towards the rainy day fund and be put away in reserves. Um, or if the rainy day fund happens to be uh, full, then it's supposed to go towards infrastructure spending, which is sort of a permanent benefit for this one-time funds. Um, so, you know, it could be that this recent growth is going to be sustained because the stock market continues to go up, but we don't assume that. Um, so once again, you know, like a lot of those one-time monies are, we are trying to put those towards one-time uses rather than increasing the amount that we spend on ongoing expenditures. Um, and, you know, once burned, twice shy, it was actually very helpful that lots of people were very burned by that. And now it's a much easier uh, sort of discussion with the legislature where, okay, we know it's one time, we know it's ongoing, let's only build in ongoing spending with ongoing revenues. And I think has the legislative analyst, I think, has recommended holding half of the increase uh, in reserve and not spending it, uh, even for one time things, which yeah. I think is, if, if I remember correctly, I, I think I read that somewhere. It's interesting. I worry what if things do decline, what this, the state will do what they did before and take money away from cities because they can't take them, take it away from schools and local government in general, actually. Um, it, it's one of the reasons why having those reserves is so valuable because you can ensure a little bit more stability for locals and ensure some of that stability. Um, although, you know, locals should probably also think about having their own reserves um, because the state government can't cushion everything. Um, one of the things that we were very worried about when we thought that the stock market was going to go down and stay down was um, in the last recession, a couple things happened. Um, so one, it was a recession, so that was bad. Um, two, the stock market went down. Um, and so pension obligations went up. And three, the price of housing also went down. So for locals, that was kind of like a triple whammy. In this case, you know, some of those things that normally happen during recessions that we think about as worries, um, those didn't happen. So hopefully it'll be a little bit easier. Thanks for a great presentation. Yeah, any other questions? I think Ray had something. Yeah, a couple of them, uh, uh, Irina. The first is I have read from various sources that inflation adjusted property tax per capita has actually increased since Prop 13. That- um, I wouldn't be surprised, but, um, so you have like this very disparate impact. So for someone who um, has, own their home since Prop 13. Oh, ab absolutely. There's all sorts of cases where you have uh, Pasadena or I know the case in Berkeley where somebody bought a house in the hills during the heart of the 60s riots, paid nothing for it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's now worth well over $3 million. So yeah, there's all sorts of mm -hmm. those kinds of things, but that's just the, the first one I just 
wanted to find out whether you disagreed in general. And I agree there may be an equity issue and there's also a location issue and so forth. The second is, I'm curious why you're surprised or, or why you say housing is unaffordable. The way I look at it is on a payment basis and $100 a month buys you $100,000 30 year mortgage at present rates roughly. So $3,000 a month would pay $750,000 and that, you know, would have seen, obviously you need to come up with a down payment and qualify and all those other good things. But it really doesn't surprise me because what I see now compared to when I grew up, everybody is a two income family. And so the first spouse's income pays the general cost of living, car payments, food, et cetera. And the second goes entirely to a uh, mortgage payment. And assuming somebody's making 75 and takes home half, which would be, you know, probably they'd do better than that at 75K. It just doesn't surprise me to see the house prices go up. Uh, what am I missing? Um, so again, the income distribution is very skewed. And, mm -hmm. you know, Davis is very self-selected for people who do better. Um, yeah. The people who have done really well over the last couple of decades are the ones who have higher education. That, mm -hmm. That's a lot of people in Davis. Yeah. Um, and the returns to getting that education um, have gone up by a lot. So yeah. houses in Davis are affordable for the people who can afford to live in Davis. Yeah. Um, but he I but in terms example, of my, how many yeah. people can yeah. actually afford that, sorry, let me, let me just finish my thought. Yeah. Um, so the inflation adjusted median household income is right around 70 to $73,000. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is generally, you know, that could be two people, that could be one person, um, that's like over all types of households. Okay. Um, but the reason why more people are dual earner income, dual earner couples is because they have to be. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then the final is how much concern is there about the departure of high net worth and high income people? And I say that because one of the owners of my firm just relocated to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. The other one is seriously looking at moving into Incline Village, and therefore he would be paying, you know, only California tax on the percentage of sales from California, rather than the excess over the other state rates. It drops the average, you know, tax rate from about twelve percent to about six. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a concern among the legislature and the governor? Absolutely. Um, it's something that we talk about as in, in terms of risks uh, in our budget. Uh, we are not actually seeing that um, that is happening with so many people. Um, so people do tend to see those people who complain about it and then leave. Um, mm -hmm. But there are people as well who move to California because California is a really amazing place to find Got great it. talent okay. and to hire new graduates. Um, and so as long as there is this incoming flow of people who are finding it profitable to be here and to start their new businesses here, I mean, Airbnb clearly chose to stay here. DoorDash has chosen to stay here. We got a lot of money from their IPOs. Um, you know, there, there's always been people leaving California to set up manufacturing elsewhere. And it is in fact a much lo more longstanding trend that if you want big and cheap and you know industrial, you don't stay in California because that's not California's strength. Um, so. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So are there other questions from other commissioners? I'm not seeing any. Um, again, I just want to say thank you so much, Irina. This has been fascinating. If you had been my, uh, my economics professor in college, I might have had a whole different career path. You've just made this, the connection so clear, and it's, it's really been a great presentation. And 
Thank you. Uh, again, we appreciate your time in this busy, busy period of the year. So, my pleasure. Um, and uh, so part of my job is to help explain what's going on in the California economy with the general public. So if you um, or staff have questions in the future, please don't hesitate to reach me. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Appreciate all of your presentations and explanation and answers to questions. So thank you very much for that. Um, with that, uh, we'll move on, on to um, our next agenda item. Great. Thank you so much. You know what I'd like to do just um, as we move into the next item, because David uh, has been able to get his um, audio. David, did you want to record your vote for the um, consent calendar or any of the really the consent calendar or just the approval of the agenda? I don't know if it's just me. He, I think he thought his audio was working and I'm not able to hear him. So. His phone is muted, so it doesn't show that he's un unmuted the phone, so. Okay, all right. Well, we can come back if we, we need to later. So our next item on the agenda is to appoint a vice chair. So the typical process for the committee is to select a chair, a vice chair on an annual basis in July and so with Michelle's departure, I moved into the chair position and now we have a vacancy in the vice chair position, which we, we just would need to fill for this six month period. And um, before I ask for discussions and nominations, I wonder, is there any public comment on this item? Do we see any public comment, Elena? I see none. None, Donna. Thank you. And so the, the as you know, I mean, the, the role of chair and vice chair, you know, chair sort of facil facilitates the meetings and outside of the meetings, there's a, a bit of work in terms of just coordinating, putting the agenda together, um, having a planning meeting with um, Elena and staff. Um, and really the role of the vice chair is primarily to step in and help the chair. It can be as active a role as, as desired, really. Um, I know that Michelle and, and Paul had a very much a partnership where they did a lot of the work. They shared the work between the two of them uh, outside of meetings. Um, it can be that way or it can be a less engaged, less involved vice chair. It's kind of, a, you know, just a matter of working it out but I'd like to see if anyone is interested or if there are nominations for a vice chair, if anyone would like to nominate someone or nominate yourself, which is perfectly fine if you choose to do that. I'm happy to put my hand up. So I've got, so Ezra, are you, are you, would, would you be interested in being vice chair? For six months, uh -huh. give it a shot. Okay. okay, and I see Paul has his hand up. And now Paul, you're muted. Sorry, uh, David can't speak, so I was gonna nominate him. <laughs> I know, I feel so Actually, bad. Actually, I think oh, I wait. like, I, I respect my colleagues mm -hmm. enough that I think any of you would be fine as vice chair. But I think as Donna says, it can take a lot of time, which is why I'm not interested in doing it again. But, but David would be fine. Ezra would be great. Um, any of you. Great, thank you. You know, um, Elena, uh, David just emailed me, and I think you have to. His phone is unmuted at his end. It looks like there's something you need to do to unmute him when he's on the phone at your end. Um. I'm looking here to see if there's anything. Um, I don't see. I can ask him to unmute, but that's all. He's, he's unmuted. He's not muted. Um, Donna, can you tell if he wants, uh, by a raise of hand or whatever, if he wants to be nominated? Okay, I will, I will, I will, I think he can hear me. So what I will tell him is if he would like to be nominated to be vice chair, he should either email me or raise his hand to 
let me know that. And see what I see here. I'm not seeing a raised hand. Can you all, you can see him. I, I, I guess you can't see him because now he's just on the phone, right? No, we can see him. We can see him. We can see, see him. I can't see him. Can That's you ask him to, to raise, raise his hand or wave his arms if he can uh, hear us? Okay. David, can you hear us? Yes, he can hear us. Okay. Okay, okay poor David. So would you like to be nominated to be vice chair? He's laughing. <laughs> about thumbs up or thumbs down? <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs down because we can't hear you. Eh, he says eh, um, which I, I don't think. So, um, so we have, um, an, uh, Ezra is, is self-volunteering to be vice chair. Um, I would, if no one else would like to make any other nominations, I would move that we um, select Ezra. As I'll second. Way. Second. So I made the motion. Who was that seconding it? Doug. Doug. Doug second the motion. So let me take the roll. And uh, Donna, Paul has his hand up. So I just want to make sure. Uh, that was the earlier. I'm done. Okay, you're done. Right. Okay. So I'm going to call the roll. This is to select Ezra Beeman as vice chair for this period from now through July 1. Um, Ezra? What's form here? Do you are you supposed to like abstain if it's voting for yourself? No, you you do not have no. to abstain. You may absolutely vote for yourself, and you can even nominate yourself for a position. Well, I just did that, so I'm already <laughs> through the threshold. Okay. Uh, I. Okay. Um, Doug. Aye. Uh, Jacobs. Paul, I think you're muted. Apologies. The new technology, aye. And Neville, aye. Uh, Solomon? Aye. Sandino? Aye. <laughs> the new technology. And Gukern, Sufi? Aye. OK, that passes unanimously. Ezra, congratulations. You're the new vice chair. Thank you. It's going to be fun. OK, so our, our next item of business and I just want to set the stage for this one just a little bit because this is sort of a, a revisitation of a discussion on a paper that Ezra and his subcommittee had submitted to our last meeting. And at that meeting, we had sort of run short of some time. Um, a couple of commissioners indicated they had some comments they wanted to provide. We didn't really have time to kind of discuss it thoroughly and give you guidance. And I know Ezra, you and I've talked and you, you still haven't really had an opportunity given the holidays and everything to get staff feedback and to really you know, rework this. So what I'd like to do tonight is really just take this opportunity to make sure that you um, understand the comments that a couple of commissioners had, both Ray Solomon and David Sandino submitted some comments and other commissioners may wanna give you feedback as well. And I thought we could just move into that. Um, so what I propose we do is um, I'd like to just see if there's any public comment first, because I know we did receive one or two comments in writing, and then I'd like to move into our discussion. So I don't know if there's anyone on the line who wants to make public comment now, but we have two comments submitted in writing. I do not see at the time, uh, Donna, um, anyone wanting to speak from the public. So, okay, so let me just, Elena, um, different um, commissions are using different protocols. These were received in writing. Uh, some people are just posting them and attaching them after the fact to their agenda. I would feel more comfortable if I read them into the record now. They're both pretty brief. That's fine. And I'm just going to quickly run, read them. Um, these are two emails that all of us should have received. Um, one came in around six this evening um, from Bob Fung. And it says, since the development of the Leland model, the long range general fund forecast model has been made public on the city's website. The model is designed so the public cannot see the internals of the model, but can adjust assumptions that drive the results. 
This has been a significant improvement in the transparency of city finances to citizens. I suggest that economic analyses for major projects follow this example and that the models be made available to the public in a similar fashion. Point number two, when economic analyses for major projects have been published previously, the result the public hears is usually a handful of dollar figures, e.g. X million dollars for the city, Y million dollars for the school district, et cetera. These are projections usually over 10 to 20 years. Single numeric estimates do not seem to capture the uncertainties inherent in this kind of time frame. In the long range general fund model, I believe that three scenarios are usually chosen for analysis. I recommend the commission consider whether this would be helpful and informative to citizens. And that's from Bob Fung. And the second comment came in from Richard McCann. Um, and he, he says, I found the subcommittee report insightful and quite useful for identifying potential means of addressing, addressing fiscal analyses. However, I have comments on two items in the proposal. One, replacement CapEx. Future investment costs should only be included in the analysis if that infrastructure will be debt financed. The reason is that future infrastructure should be paid for by future residents and businesses, not current residents and businesses. Current residents and businesses are already paying for the current infrastructure. So putting aside funds today for future investments would be double payment and future residents and businesses would be underpaying. Sinking funds are uneconomic and unfair to current parties. This item should be removed from the estimate of fiscal shortfall. That said, the analysis should not assume that the investment cost goes to zero at some future date. The most sensible assumption is that the annual cost will continue in perpetuity. The second point is about 25% fixed city costs. Most organizations have scale economies up to a certain size. Davis likely is still far below reaching the point of diminishing returns. Instead of assuming a simplistic 100% of average costs, the city should either require the next consultant to conduct a study or join in a study with other cities in the region to estimate the scale factor on increased community size and associated government costs. Scale economies often run at a factor of 80%, i.e. 100% increase in size leads to an 80% in costs. Municipalities may not follow this path, but it is an alternative choice that can be tested empirically. So those are the two public comments. Um, so I know it's unfortunate, I'm sorry that David's not able to get his audio working because he was one of the two commissioners who had submitted comments, he and Ray both. And um, Anna, I, I certainly, Anna. sorry, Elena. Sorry. No, I just wanted to say David is unmuted at the moment, or at least it shows up as unmuted. So let's see if he can talk. <laughs> Great. David, can you, are you able to be heard? Can you hear me? Yes, it's so exciting. Can, okay. Yay, perfect. Yeah, great. Took, took a while, but I figured it out. Oh, fantastic. Perfect timing, because what I was just going to say is that you submitted a comment, as did Ray, and and I really appreciate both of your comments, and I know I appreciate Ray's was very thrilling, but what I'm hoping tonight is we could really, Ezra and his subcommittee, something very concrete and tangible to work on. And one of the things that I found useful was, David, your, your suggestion to really hone in on the impact fees made a lot of sense to me, and I'd like to hear what the other commissioners have to say about that, and also what the subcommittee's responses, because that seems like a really valuable undertaking. So Paul, you have your hand up? Yes. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I think the subcommittee's memo and many of Ray's comments, which are both stimulate a lot of thought, and at least for me, and some very interesting ideas there. Um, but I think I like what David has suggested because what it focuses on one issue that I think we can all agree on, which is let's go deep on the whole question of these um, uh, impact fees. It seems to me that, especially because I mean, they point out that they were frozen as of a certain 
date and so on. Uh, it seems to me that this is something that we could be helpful on. My one question is, is the city itself, is city staff reviewing impact fees? Are they going to be hiring a consultant to look at impact fees um, going forward? And what could we do as a commission or as uh, could a couple of us do as uh, on a subcommittee uh, that would be helpful? Yeah, that's a great question, Paul. Elena, is there any current undertaking on the part of city staff to look at this issue? Um, I know this has been a discussion and a uh, number, or what I have heard is that the city would like to update the general plan. Um, and based on that, based on what the general plan update will bring, uh, then update the fees so that it reflects whatever the new developments might be um, established or planned for. And what would be the time frame for doing that in the context of the general plan? Um, I'd have to find out that. I am not certain. I have not been participating in uh, with the plan on general fund, uh, general plan update. I know one of the first uh, parts and required one is the housing element. And I know, as we all know, that um, that's been worked on, but I'm not sure what the time frame for the remaining general plan update is. I and I don't know if you know this um, or not, but in the past, and I know it's been some time since the fees were updated, when they were done before, was it something city staff did or was it done by a consultant? Um, usually a consultant is hired to um, get that completed, um, at least even in my prior experiences. I'm not sure specifically with Davis. I, am, I have a, a hunch that it was done with the consultant, uh, but I know when the discussion did happen, um, somewhat recently, I guess, um, the thought was to engage a consultant to assist with that work. And just out of curiosity, is, is that because we don't have the, the resources to do it, or is it because there is really some, some true expertise that the consultants bring? Perhaps they have a, you know, a broader perspective where they know what all the different cities do and they can bring that to the work? Um, I would suggest that normally I would have suggested to bring a consultant just because it's a very, well, I would call it quite a complicated um, area of law um, and just a, there's a number of items that you have to be aware of. Um, I would say for that reason, otherwise I do not necessarily know if we have somebody on staff who is well-versed in that. Mm -hmm. Donna? Yes. Um, I, I think Doug was leading the charge in our former subcommittee. Uh, he, he might have some, some insights here. Uh, the other thing I would put, uh, say though, is I think if you look at two iterations ago of the impact assessment report, it was done by city staff, but I think the one, the, the most recent one was done by a, uh, by a consultant. Yeah, I, I believe that uh, the, the, the full impact fee update, the most recent one that was done was in 2009. And I think that was done by Bay Area Economics. I can't find it right now at my fingertips, but it, it was an outside consultant, I, I believe. So other comments and questions from commissioners on this? I have a couple of thoughts, but I want to make sure I hear from everyone. Donna, it, I think, maybe, could I say a couple of words? Sure. Um, so first of all, I, I just wanted to, to start off by uh, apologizing for the process. Um, I'm hoping that we, uh, we uh, as a body, and this is what we discussed last time, just what is the process for kicking off one of these papers, consulting with folks before you actually get here? I thought that was a really good suggestion uh, by Paul last time. Uh, and so while this, this particular paper is, we're just being pragmatic about trying to get input so that when we come back, it does have that consultation. Uh, the other two papers uh, that are being worked on, um, we are going through a process of meeting with the task force, then going out for um, sort of council stakeholders and, and city uh, stakeholders 
and, and then bringing it back to this, uh, this body. And I think by doing that, it will uh, be already validated to some degree. So anyway, I want to apologize for the process here. That's not the intention, at least the intention for me moving, moving forward. Um, no apology needed, and I appreciate the clarification, and you're right. I think it, it'll it help us all going forward. Um, I, first of all, I appreciate any initiative that subcommittees take and the ideas that they come up with, but what I'm, where, where I'm landing on this, this right now is that I think, I know with all the holidays and everything, it wasn't really possible for your subcommittee to sit down and get the perspective of city staff, and so I think what I would recommend is that, that you do that and also get feedback from our council liaisons and really kind of sit down with them and sort of come back to us at our next meeting with something that is perhaps a more kind of a more um, targeted um, proposal. Like based on those consultations, what is it you think we as a commission or you as a subcommittee could really tackle? Um, the other, uh... So I got a couple of, so first of all, I also want to say thanks to everybody who put in written questions. I know some were asked on the day. Uh, David, I didn't have any, I just have a bunch of tick marks here. So largely in agreement with what you said. Uh, thank you. Um, Ray, you've got a, you've got a comprehensive uh, set of suggestions here. Um, and I was hoping if this was appropriate to, to just ask some clarifying questions. Sure, please go um, ahead. Certainly. So, I think the I think some of your suggestions here fall under process like time to review, and I feel like that is that doesn't sort of that's not just on how we do large pro, you know major project economic analysis. It's just generally what should the process of bringing these things these papers and it's almost like hey we as a subcommittee are are um, committing to a more consultative process with more forewarning all that sort of stuff and likewise we're asking for the city to be more consultative and give us more information in advance, et cetera. Um, so I, do you agree that yeah, that's sort of where you were going? Yeah, I debated putting in number one. Uh, the reason was that you also had some general commentary about the project. And so that's why I put that in. I agree that that might be something completely separate from what your, sub, uh, what your task force is doing. The other question I had for you is you have traffic in here, which um, I mean, I think you've got you got some great suggestions and I myself have done modeling in the value of leisure time and your approach, you know, is very consistent with the literature there. Um, yeah, I don't know that I actually that was more of a statement than a question. The one thing I guess, and not to sort of tie up too much time, but if you go to 3C on the pop property tax revenue, um, one of the one of the things I really got excited about was this notion of um, the city revenue split and having that agreed in advance. And, and, and Councilman Dan uh, has probably got some background here as to how realistic that is, but it seems to make a lot of sense that rather than doing it on a case by case basis that we have something that can be hammered out and it reduces risk, et cetera. Do you, I don't know what, do you have any comments on that, Dan? I can tell you, uh, Will Arnold and I were the council subcommittee that negotiated the agreement with the county on uh, in the wake of Nishi 2.0, if you will, as well as, as, well as West Davis, Davis Active Adult co Committee. We strove personally to try to come with a, up with a model for those two projects that the, count, the county agreed to we thought would be a good model going forward. Um, uh, the negotiations had commenced uh, and had been in process for some time with the county, um, uh, but were not completed before the voters uh, voted down Measure B. So I don't think that process is going to continue. Um, if, if, you, if you want to bind the county to agree to what we did before, I'm down with that. But uh, I don't know that we can uh, uh, prevail on the county to do so. Uh, and of course, there is some truth to the fact that every project is different. That project was different from the two before that were completely residential projects for the most part. Um, um, so there are, there are counties where there is a set playbook but I can also tell you that uh, from what we know and have investigated about county agreements with other jurisdictions within Yellow County, 
Um, <laughs> there are big differences from community to community on what's been agreed to. Yeah, my thought was solely that we were way down the road with the various projects and that is not consistent with stopping it for a 10 point difference. Perhaps negotiating more generally in the absence of anything would put it in a stronger position. That was my sole thought process. You'd feel no less pressure to do a deal. Yes, there's no pressure to do a deal. And as a matter of fact, a lower percentage for the county may encourage the city to be more proactive, et cetera. So I thought that might be something that could be a task force focus. Um, yeah, and I don't know that that's uh, the time, you know, this kind of thing may or may not be part of your task force answer, but I just thought it was a comment for me the projects in general. Okay. I got two, two clarifying questions and then I'll shut up. Um, okay. what, is it, what do you mean here by substitution effects from the DISC project on 3E? Page. So, so it didn't make sense to me that I could add that much supply without affecting rates elsewhere. In other words, people would go down the road from Shilling Robotics from wherever. It's even mentioned in the EIR. So I think there, there is a real supply and demand effect you know, from one side of town to the other. Okay. Just simple Thank you. demand. The other thing I wanted to ask was on number four, you talk about the vacancy rate in Davis at 0.5%. Is that the residential, the, the, the residential vacancy rate, or is that the yes. commercial? That was okay. the residential. I'm sorry, I should have uh, clarified okay. that. And that was something that came up. Uh, I remember the public, it might have been uh, Matt Williams, but I'm not sure who, you know, mentioned that it was modeled at the, a very reasonable general average of five when the vacancy rate in Davis was 0.5. And that results in X number more people requiring services. That's all that's about. Thank you. Um, I think hurdle rates would be something I'd be interested in, but not, 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 not now. Um, yeah. And um, I agree with the employment numbers. If we could get somehow do more work to get the data on people who work here, not only people who work here, but people who visit and people who transit through, I think that will really help inform where the impacts are coming from and what the opportunities are. Yeah, these are Thank more, you. you know, questions that I think we should, either as part of your task force or elsewhere, have in our back, have the answers to before the next major project comes forward. For for a lot of reasons, I don't know. Are you finished, Ezra? I'm, sorry. I'm done. Thank you. For a lot of reasons, I would leave traffic out of this. It seems to me that these are not city finance questions. These are external costs, uh, diseconomies. Uh, I know the EIRs take this into account, but isn't that planning? I mean, in other words, so we, wor we worry about the carbon burden of a new project. Uh, one of my criticisms, I would say, of the EIRs is that they tend not to consider what would happen. I mean, they do have a nothing, do nothing alternative almost always. But I don't think they take into account when they look at do nothing, where else would the growth go? For example, in carbon and carbon emissions, uh, if Davis doesn't build uh, some sort of an innovation center, will the business go to, to Woodland? In which case, who knows the carbon uh, issues could be much worse. I don't know. Woodland might be much more eager to uh, to have that business than we are. Uh, also, in terms of traffic, uh, one of the alternatives the public has talked about is let's have more density downtown and so on. 
but that also has traffic and implications. So if you don't do this project, and if you're successful in getting more business elsewhere, you're also gonna, you might tie up traffic someplace else in town, or you might have more, this is a very complex issue. And I'm not sure that you're very provocative and, and interesting and, and uh, an economic analysis is, I think, well, I think it's, it's a little bit simplified. And I also don't think it's a, it's not a city budgetary issue. So I would put that on the back burner. It's an interesting issue. We could bring it up. We could deal with it, I think, but uh, yeah. to me, I, I would think love to have more to come... take up when we, when we have a consultant in front of us. Yeah, Who's I would love to have more us. discussion about this with the broader commission. I would respectfully disagree with you because if you think about it as the effect on the city, including both the citizenry and our government, in effect, I have a number of people who would be paying an additional tax to have whatever positive effect it had on the city. So that's why, you know, I think the analysis is effectively incomplete, at least relative to the residents of Davis. But again, I, I think it's, I understand your points. I'd recommend we put this on an agenda for the future meetings. I wouldn't object to that. And I would say, I still think our top priority ought to be these, uh, the impact fees. If we can make a contribution there, I think we could easily, I think, well, not maybe not so easily, find out what other communities are doing. And I'm not See, sure, by the way, on that, I buy the argument that we have to wait for the general plan to be completed. I think we might have some a beneficial effect by looking at it as the general plan is, is developed. Um, so I look at the, the impact fees in two ways. The first is I think we should update them to be sure that they are fully compensatory and on the other side of that scale, completely fair to those paying them, because they're supposed to exactly equal your costs of providing, sure. offsetting the impacts. They're not supposed to be uh, profit positive, if you will. The second uh, piece of it, though, is relative to any given project, since they are lawfully required to offset and only offset the actual costs, they're a net zero. So from a specific project standpoint, unless you're gonna argue they're erroneous, they are zero on a net basis. Yeah, I'm trying to get my head around that. Dan actually participated in these negotiations. And I'm sure, uh, did people talk about net zero, Dan? I mean, it's, it, I think there's a lot of in, intangible costs that, that, you put, that, that you can negotiate for. I mean, where you, where you can say, well, look, we're gonna need a new road here. And, uh, you ought to pay for all of it or whatever, uh, or half of it, or I, I guess I don't fully understand how- the You can negotiate other upgrades as part of a development agreement, but the specific impact fees by law are to equal the cost of those impacts. I, you, I'm you, responding to- the subcommittee analysis that shows that by, I think it's by not doing a 2% per annum increase, we've, uh, uh, to account for inflation, we've lost um, $6.9 million. Um, I don't know if that's correct or not, but it's a, it's a large number and uh, 
you know, I, it, it seems it implies that we haven't been charging enough. That, that may be the case. Which and is why so I think like, we should focus on yeah. that. Right, I think that's why it's, it is such an important issue. So what I wanna do, cause I think we're, we're getting pretty late on time here. And again, the, the purpose here tonight was just for us to kind of give uh, the subcommittee some feedback and, and, and again, we really need for you to circle back with staff and our liaisons. And so do you feel like you have enough feedback to do that and then come back to us at our next meeting with perhaps a, a really targeted list of what it is you are planning to accomplish? Does that make sense for you? That's for Ezra. Uh, Ezra and anybody, I just wanna make sure you feel like you have enough to kind of circle back and, and bring this back to us after some staff consultation. Well, I'd like to hear Ezra's response. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, <clears throat> so I, I've clarified the questions I had from from Ray. Um, I'm not sure I can get all get all of them addressed in, in the paper. I mean, the, the paper was originally uh, just trying to focus on the analysis we've done previously about what were the biggest variables that we should probably focus on getting, That's what getting I'm a saying. bit there. Maybe I'm not being clear. Sorry. Um, we, we don't want to produce papers. We want to have real impact on the city and it's on its budget. And so, and I think in order to, to move forward with your paper and your proposal, you want to circle back with city staff, get their perspective on some of these ideas, also talk with our liaisons. And then with all of those conversations are hopefully going to we'll be come really back. Crucial. Then you come back and say, okay, now we've got a lot more information than we had before. And that's really informed us. So here are here's what we really want to focus on. That's what that's what I'm hoping will come out of this. Yep. Does that that make sense? Well, it does to me. I, Doug, or Kern, yeah, I would. I just reiterate. There's, there's. I think there's a strong focus on impact fees, and I think that's that's totally appropriate. I think that's again, there's, there's a few the things way. we might tackle in there, but I do think that impact fees is the is the is the number one uh, uh, um, issue. To, to, to start really getting into. Yeah. And I, I kind of agree with uh, with Doug on that. It sounds like we have, to summarize what's, what's kind of transpired, we have a list of, of points that we should address um, or at least look at as a subcommittee. And then we're gonna prioritize in a conversation with the city and then we will bring back our priorities. Sounds good. Any further discussion? Right. So I just want to move on to our next item. Um, and this is going to be sort of a standing item, uh, item 60, where we look at whether we need to create any additional ad hoc subcommittees. This pretty quickly. I'm just going to throw out an idea, uh, two ideas. First, we're not sure whether we actually created the local content preferences uh, subcommittee in our last meeting. So in the interest of efficiency and time, let's just do it here because we know that Ezra and others, you're working on something. Which is that the same subcommittee? Is it Ezra, Gukern, and, and Doug, or who's working on that? Yep. Same group. So why don't we just authorize you to proceed and, and go forth with that as a, a, as a subcommittee and work on that. Do you think you're gonna have something to bring back to us in our next meeting? Uh, yeah, we're, let me know, but. yeah, I don't wanna hex it. Okay. Um, there's also the, uh, the marginal cost analysis. I thought we approved two things last time, uh, economic development and marginal cost analysis. I think we, did approve marginal cost analysis too. I think the marginal cost analysis is a is a component of the um, of the major projects analysis. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did too. Right, and that's again. I think we're doing impact fees, 
marginal cost, I think, is actually kind of an easy, easy one. We've had a, one talk, one discussion about it, and so anyway, upon further discussion with city staff and liaisons and everyone else, I think we'll be able to bring a recommendation to, for a policy on that fairly soon. Right. That's a piece of that of the um, of the in, uh, major projects. Is yeah, they all, they all arguably fit under this broad umbrella. I'll just mention one thing here, um, since we're in a, in a public setting, and this is, I won't have another opportunity to talk with you about your subcommittee. The, the idea of um, having local preferences for, for um, contracting and purchasing, um, it, it, it raises a lot of uh, legal and constitutional issues. So it's just something you'll want to be mindful of, and we'll probably want to get some by some some uh, feedback from the city attorney about that. There, there is a way, I believe, to do it in a way that's constitutional, but it takes some careful thought. Thank you. I hadn't thought about reaching out to them. Um, just to be, be aware of... that there are issues around that. Thank you. So good. So you guys have a plan. That's great. So um, let's do this. So um, I, I think let me let me back up just a little. I think this local content thing can easily fit under your your current committee. I don't think you need any action by us to authorize you. The only thing I would suggest we do here tonight, and I think it was an oversight in our last meeting, one of the committees that didn't get carried forward was the one that Paul and Michelle used to be on, which was the admin and communications subcommittee. And Paul reached out to me and thought that there was value in putting that committee back in place. So if someone wants to make a motion to reestablish that committee, um, I'm very interested in doing that work. And I know Paul's interested in continuing it if someone wants to make a motion to that effect. Also move. So Paul moves the creation of a admin and communication subcommittee with Jacobs and Neville's their second. So is that a second? So vote? Is there a second? Oh yeah, I'm Beeman seconds. Beeman seconds, so I'll just call the roll. Um, Beeman? Aye. Busby? Aye. Jacobs? Aye. Neville? Aye. Solomon? Aye. Bendino? Sufi? Aye. Oh, good. So we'll have that subcommittee. Um, Donna, a quick question. So with the subcommittee uh, for the one you just was reinstated, is there, um, are you looking at a particular project um, issue to address or? We haven't cooked one up yet, but from what I've heard from Michelle and Paul, that was a pretty valuable exercise. So I'm sure Paul will have some ideas. We don't have a sp very specific thing we're going to work on next. But if you if you want to suggest something, we are all ears. Um, not at the moment, but I will consider some of the um, topics. Great, thank you. So, moving on to, and I just put this here, Doug, in case. I put a, a, a something on 6E for a, a housing element subcommittee. I know you don't have any further updates for us because you haven't had any meetings, but just in the event that commissioners wanted to give Doug any feedback that he could take to his housing element subcommittee meeting, I put this here as a placeholder on our agenda. Does anyone want to provide any feedback or comments to be taken back to that subcommittee? I will say, just so you know, we do have a meeting on Thursday that is supposed to be our last meeting, the Housing Element Subcommittee. Um, so um, I guess now's your, now's your opportunity. Um, I have a question. Sure. Doug, what are you guys going to do in the last meeting? I believe we are going to be reviewing a draft um, uh the housing element um i'm not entirely certain yet um we there 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 still have been there's still a fair amount of discussion kind of like broad economic principles and um you know policies that that people are advocating for in terms of affordable housing 
um, you know, financing of uh, affordable housing trust fund, you know, these kind of things. So there's still a lot, a lot of very high level discussions going on. So it's not clear to me that we will be to the point of um, being ready to um, review an actual draft of, of the plan. But. Well, thank you. Donna, um, real quickly, can we just circle back and get David's um, votes on the approval of the agenda and the minutes? Yeah, I've tried to three or four times and every time I, we can try, is he unmuted? I'm unmuted, it's, oh, it's on your end now. Oh, oh, fantastic. So um, did you wanna record your vote for the, um, um, let's see. Yeah, I, I for both. <laughs> okay, yes. Thank you. Great, thanks. Does anyone else have further thoughts <laughs> for Doug on his attendance at the meeting? None. Is there any public comment on this issue? I see none. Okay, very good. So moving along to item seven. So this is just an opportunity for other subcommittees to report out on their work. Um, the first one is, I don't know if there's any updates on, on the committee for the review of police department contracts. David, did you have an update to provide? I don't have an update. Um, it's actually broader than police. It was public safety. I, I take, I would take the fire department as well. Uh, okay. we're, I'm just waiting for staff to provide uh, some contracts to look at. Once that happens, uh, go from there. Okay, that sounds good. Sounds very good. Um, there's um, the second update is from the subcommittee related to using some excess water and sewer funds for OPEB and pension liability. And that's me, Ray, and Gakern. Ray, do you want to do the update or how do you want to work it? We didn't talk about it. I have the update. You're muted. I'm sorry. I know you had talked to staff. I'd be curious what the feedback was from that meeting. Yeah. So um, let me give everybody just a little update and context. So um, basically where we stand, as, as you all know, we, we made a recommendation as a subcommittee um, back in July that some of the excess reserves in the water and sewer fund be used to pay down the OPEB and pension liabilities attributable to those employees. And um, you all approved us going forward with that. But then in October, we had a further discussion at our meeting and uh, the city attorney's office came as well because we were of the understanding there's some concerns related to our proposal and basically what we learned in that meeting was that it could be done as long as we hired an actuary to properly account for the payment so that we could track them and, and be sure that we were paying the right amounts and doing things properly. So what we are at this point, we, we just need some further feedback from Elena and her staff about that, whether, whether you know, what that cost would be to hire the actuary. Is that feasible? Because we, we want to make recommendations that make sense. And if if the cost of, of actuary and the administrative overhead and doing that is excessive, then that may outweigh the benefit of our, of our recommendation. But so we're waiting, we need that. And Elena and I talked and we're hopeful that by next meeting, she can give us an update on that. So that's the only update that I really have. Any questions or discussion? So is that cost estimate in progress or not in progress? Hi, this is Elena. So no, I have not inquired. Um, and actually, I perhaps that was a misunderstanding for me. I didn't realize this was a request at the last meeting um, that you actually wanted to get a pricing on it. I can tell you that from just a standpoint uh, of just what it might come out of, it um, probably wouldn't be um, an outrageous cost on the OPEB side of it because we already have an actuary looking at all the details that relate to other post-employment benefits. However, our current actuary 
does not do any actuarial work that relates to pension. All of that is currently done and the information is provided through CalPERS. So that would be, I, in my opinion, and obviously I can ask for um, a quote, but that would be a significantly greater cost just because we would need to provide full detail um, on all of our um, pensioner population um, and figure out what information will be needed specifically for them to address that. So that's just kind of uh, right off the top of my head, just to kind of give you some idea. Um, again, OPEB is probably going to be you know, more feasible, first of all, and we'll need to determine what type of work will need to be done on the pension side. So speaking for myself, this appears to be a substantively good idea from a financial standpoint. And what I'm interested in, and I think our subcommittee is interested in, and frankly, I've never heard any dissension from the first time it was brought up with the commission, you know, I think two and a half years ago. So we're looking to move this forward or we're looking to hear, you know, a robust counter argument that, you know, somebody's standing up and saying, this is not a good idea because in very direct, unequivocal, easy to understand terms. And so that's what we're, and at least I'm looking for is just one of those two things. Let's go manage with facts. Let's go get a quote. Or if there's other concerns, you know, not on the table, let's get a piece of paper with those written down and schedule a meeting to discuss them. Uh, I don't know, Donna, Gurkur, do you see it any differently? Well, I agree. It would be really nice if we could have a, if we could, if we could have Elena's recommendation on our proposal, whether good or bad. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. So Elena, do you want it? Would you like to meet with us too? Would that be a helpful conversation for the three of us to sort of schedule some time to talk with you as well between now and next meeting? Um, yes, I do believe that's a good idea. I would also include our utilities and operations department just because this is their um, funding. They um, manage rates um, for um, all of the utilities. So I do believe they need to be participating in this discussion. Sure, no, that's fine. They they actually have already participated in discussions with us at our meetings probably before you were here, but that's great. We're, we're happy to, to have that. And I can work with you on setting that up. So that would be good. That sounds good. So we will do that. We will set that up and try to move forward. Um, the other... Um, Update, we've just really had Doug and Ezra and Gurkhan, we've already had the um, update on your subcommittee. So our only other item tonight is our long range calendar. And um, we have nothing on the calendar right now for February. And um, one, one idea, which I think is a really important one is for us to have a, a sort of a, a full discussion about what it is that we as a commission can do to help assist in the review of the budget. And so um, I'd like, when we come to that, I have to put some thought into that agenda item, but I'd very much like to hear from our liaisons at that meeting about how we can be most useful in our review of the budget. Um, we may want to decide as a commission to form a budget review subcommittee, any number of possibilities. But I know that we really want to start to be more useful in providing feedback on the budget. So that's the only suggestion I have to add to the calendar. And that was Paul's suggestion at well, as well. Are there other suggestions for items anyone would like to see added to our long range calendar? And I know I need to take hey, public comments, but I will. Donna, did I, I couldn't see the dot points that I had sent you. I mean, I'm not sure which of the papers will make it in time, but I think we'll have one of the two papers. Yeah, so as long as, I think the most important thing is for you to, you know, it sounds like you're consulting with staff and others as you're working on things, that's great. You obviously for Brown Act reasons don't wanna send them to me. 
I just need to know when I put the agenda together, I just need to know that you need time and what you need time for, that's all. So you can do that okay. up until a few days before the agenda gets published. Okay. I, I guess if we, if we, oh, go ahead. Sorry, just to close, uh, if we put a bunch of stuff on the agenda though, then it gets pushed back. So I just was flagging that I think I, we, you know, we'll be asking for some time for one, one of those papers. In Probably in February, okay. okay. We, we had an interesting email uh, from a citizen, um, Dave Taramino, and he raises questions about the city purchase of a ladder truck. It's, a, it's apparently 1.8 million bucks. Uh, I mean, I, I don't hold me to that figure. And obviously there'll be maintenance and all kinds of issues. Is that something we want to look at and put on the agenda or so, send to a subcommittee? I don't know what the timeline is on that is for the city. Yeah, I didn't even know the facts around that. I don't know, Elena, if that's anything you can fill us in, give us enough background to even know what the issue is. Isn't that under um, David's purview? It would be. It would definitely be something he could be looking at. Um, we have a couple of city council people sitting here. They may have some ideas on when this is going to come up. Um, so this is Elena, and just to answer the question, we did have a, um, a presentation to the city council, um, and to be perfectly honest, I do not remember the date at this point. I want to say it was either November or October. Um, perhaps if um, Van Carson is there, maybe he remembers this, <laughs> but um, we've done a presentation to council or specifically fire chief. And so this was just literally to get an idea from the city council if there's any interest and if the city should go, go back and um, do a research to figure out is that, you know, to figure out the cost of the truck and anything that would be associated with having a letter truck for a fire department, which includes uh, potential staffing options and um, also um, just the cost of maintenance and things like that. Um, the council, as far as I understand, um, did um, ask for some additional information that hasn't come up yet. Um, I am not certain at this point what exactly the timing would be. The other item because that was discussed was, are there any grant opportunities um, that might be available? Um, so that's just kind of to give you an update on that, but um, I'm happy to get some feedback from Dan as well and he, what he remembers. Sure, um, if, Donna, if I may. So the, the council did have this item. They discussed it on their November 10 uh, uh, council meeting. I'm being careful here to speak for council as a whole, not necessarily my particular view of the matter, uh, but uh, Elaine has characterized it quite accurately. Uh, there were a series of information requests. We council members exchanged their own ideas about how this should be, be proceed. I think it's fair to say we didn't all agree about everything. Um, there's uh, some prospect of that information coming back sooner rather than later, but uh, there was a specific date on our long range calendar that our, the city manager advised me would not be met, that they couldn't get the work done by then. Um, but my sense is that city staff is actively working on this issue. Some of it did in fact relate to the question of what grants we could obtain either to purchase the truck itself and, and, but a very significant element of the discussion is what it would cost to staff it and how it would be staffed, what our staffing model would be. Um, and then I did raise the issue of, is there, we, we know that um, the uh, university is on the brink in the next year or so of purchasing their own ladder truck. And uh, we did discuss, is there a potential for some collaboration I specifically suggested uh, maybe the university instead of buying would, would rather contribute to the staffing and the operation of ours. But there's no, no decisions were made, I think it's fair to say. And Josh is here, I, I, I would ask him to weigh in to think if, I've, if I characterized everything accurately here. 
Uh, thank you, Dan. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Josh Chapman. Um, yeah, from my recollection of those meetings, obviously I wasn't on council yet, but paid attention during that time. Um, and how you sum that up is my recollection as well on that conversation. I know that you know the city staff is in the process of looking at and preparing the information that the council um, you know requested. The only I would just suggest maybe the ship has sailed a little bit at this one. We could see what council does with this and if there's some additional information that uh, FBC could collect for us. Um, but at this point, staff is following direction from council. So, and I would defer to council because obviously we serve at your pleasure and we take up items at your pleasure, Dan. But when I interviewed with uh, Brett Lee and I think it was Lucas for the commission, it was described as doing the kinds of things that council could do if only they had time. And it would seem to me that this is right in that lane, just because it's significant, it's $1.8 million, so it's worth people's time, but it is relatively small compared to a you know, almost $70 million general fund, et cetera. We probably have time, more time than you do with everything from policy issues, personnel issues, you know, community relations, I mean, just the myriad issues that you face to dive into the nuts and bolts of this one. So I would respectfully suggest you consider sending it back to FNBC for, you know, as simply a group that can spend more time on it than the five of you. And I would just say, if there is I try to stay out of advising you how to advise me. You've heard me <laughs> make this speech countless times uh, because what is the point of that? And so yeah. if this commission wishes to make a recommendation to council, you absolutely should make it, but you should make it to more than just the, the two council members here. Okay. I have a motion then. Uh, the Finance and Budget Commission recommends that Council send the ladder truck issue to the FNBC for review and study. So Ray, before we second, I just want to ask Dan a question, um, if I could. So my understanding with this issue, it's not extremely time sensitive, right? So is this is this a is there any concern that if if the analysis city staff does were to come to us for our comment? before it goes back up to council, would that have any negative timing impacts? I guess my impression of the comments of my council colleagues on November 10 was that they view this as a time sensitive matter in that um, they are interested in making a decision on a timely basis. Um, that's my interpretation of what I heard them say. Okay. Donna, and prior to maybe second, I do see David Santino and Paul's hands are up. So please go ahead, David. I don't think we need a motion. I, I can't, I don't think we need to ask the council. I mean, if I'm understanding Dan correctly, if we want to weigh in on this, let's just weigh in on it. I mean, let's find out what the staff is doing and let's find out how other communities share. Do we have a subcommittee? that would work on this. Um, I'd put in a little time if- We'd probably form a task force, but respectfully, you know, my thought is twofold. Number one is if the majority of the council does not want it to go to the FNBC, that's a decision they can make. And then the second is, I think we will get a lot more if we go forward with council direction that to bring this to the FNBC than if we simply ask. David? Well, I'm happy um, as long as there's some opportunity for the FBC to participate. I thought what I heard is that staff is working on this now, is going to have a recommendation or analysis 
uh, for the council. So if I heard that correctly, I think it'd be helpful if either an FBC uh, subcommittee or ideally uh, the uh, entire FBC has a chance to review this as an agenda item and then provide our input formally. So the only question for me is there's enough time. I think Donna asked that question, but assuming we have enough time, I think it would be helpful for us to engage. We talked about this uh, when the uh, fire chief made his budget presentation a couple months ago. I think it, it piqued a lot of interest for us then. It came in the context of the University Mall uh, project approval. So uh, yeah, I think, I think it'd be good if we could have a chance to take a look at it. Is that a second, David? That's a second. Okay, then the motion is that the commission would review this, um, the staff analysis. Um, can I, would you be open to a friendly amendment? Absolutely. Um, that we would review the city staff analysis. Um, I'm trying to think of the right wording. I just, I don't want it to cause a slowdown in the process. If there is truly some time sensitive aspect to this, I don't want that to happen. Um, we meet once a month, council meets every two weeks. Elena, you, you said that the city manager indicated there was a delay in the analysis. Do you know when it's gonna be completed? Do you have a date certain? Um, I am not sure. I believe Dan mentioned that there might be a delay um, after the conversation perhaps with the city manager. I was not that or I don't know the timing specifically. Okay. Well, let me let me not try to make any amendments for now. Let me just call the roll. <laughs> so the motion, uh, the motion is to ask the council to yes. us, or should we just or should we ask the city manager? I would like to ask the council again if there's you know if the council feels timeliness is a more important consideration, they can vote no. And again, I think we will get a lot more support for review by this commission if we go forward with the council's direction. So in order to do that though, then, then an item has to go um, back up to council just for them to give us some direction. I don't, I don't think we wanna slow the process that way. I think what you're trying to do is say that we as a commission would like to weigh in on the analysis and potentially make a recommendation to council. That seems like a much more streamlined process. It would also include questions that council may not have had the time to consider and ask. One question I have, for example, is how often has the UC Davis ladder truck been called out? You know, do we need more than one for our metro area? And we could do a quid pro quo relative to mutual support so as to make that fair. So that, that's the kind of question that I think, you know, and again, not having had the benefit of the presentation to council, whether that information was included. So do you want to restate your motion? Sorry, I'm just needing to hear it again. The Finance and Budget Commission recommends that council direct city staff to review the appropriate data and analysis relative to purchase and staffing of a ladder truck with the Finance and Budget Commission. Okay. And then Paul, you seconded? I think it was David who seconded it. Oh, okay, sorry, David seconded. Okay, I will, I will call the roll. Ezra. I mean, I'm happy to, 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 to say I, I guess I should have asked questions earlier. Um, I just, are we, as long as somebody's ready to, to take this up, then terrific. Aye. Yeah. Doug? I'll say aye. Paul? Aye. Neville? Aye. Solomon? Aye. Bandino? Aye. And Sufi? No. Sorry? No. 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 Okay. Thank you. All right. So that's where we are on that. Um, 
Okay. May I recommend we tentatively put this item on next month's calendar, depending upon the council decision. Obviously, the chair could uh, pull it if we don't get support from the council. Right. And and the council can, it doesn't need, now that you've restated your motion, it doesn't need a, an agenda item. It can give direction to staff at any point during the meeting. But um, it seems like one of us should be pretty clear and appear at council and submit public comment requesting that they okay. do that in order for them to know that this is our request. And I can do that unless someone else wants to do it. So I hear no objection. So I'll plan to do that, to submit a letter requesting that. Okay. All right. Thank um, you. That is sort of where we are. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? I, I have just one more point. We spent a lot of time as a commission. This is for a long range calendar. Mm -hmm. We, we spent a lot of time as a commission and as various, Donna, you were on the subcommittee looking at what we called ERP, which I always oh, yes. forget Thank what it stands for. for. Thank you for reminding me. Somewhere, and it needn't be in our next agenda, but it looks like city finances aren't as in tough straits, at least in the short run, as we thought they might be. And I mean, that can we change. We could get an update at our next and meeting. So let's at least get an update and okay. see where, if, and, and obviously we're in the middle of COVID and that makes sure. all this maybe impossible. Sure. But I would like to see the city at least be ready to move ahead as soon as the pandemic wanes and if the economy sure. holds to move ahead with business software, which we've, as a commission, we've endorsed the whole notion of uh, updating this not very well used uh, patchwork kind of uh, gotcha. business software that the city is now used. Uh, yeah, now so used. I will definitely ask for an update. Thank you for that reminder, Paul. Um, and Elena's reminding me. It may not be next, week, next time, but yeah. sometime in the next few months, I would think. Absolutely. Would. Elena's reminding me that I didn't ask for public comment on the long range calendar. Thank you for the reminder. Is there any public comment on the long range calendar? There are none. Good. Um, so, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Beeman. Beeman. And who would like to? Would like Second. To Solomon. Thank you, and I'll call the roll. Uh, Beeman. Aye. Lesby. Aye. Jacobs. Paul. Aye. Neville. Aye. Solomon. Aye. Mandino. Aye. Sufi. Aye. Very good. We are adjourned. Thank you all for your comments. Good evening. Thank you all. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Josh Chapman. Good night. <laughs>